Okay, I'm Rick Sellins and I'm here in Jackson Hall today and I'm going to take some video for the airflow lab. And this is important, otherwise you wouldn't get the opportunity to see me with something like this thing on top of my head. And the little red flashing light is going. Here it goes on top of my head. So with a little luck we'll get some good pictures of what the test rigs look like. This is one of the test rigs. This is apparatus number two, and it's got a blower uh, with a motor to drive it, and this is what draws air in from the room, runs it along this pipe through a valve around the corner into a larger pipe around the corner again through an orifice plate, so there's a, a smaller diameter hole in the plate right in the middle here, here through a sudden contraction, and finally out the end where you can measure it with a pedostatic tube. Now the first thing that you'd be tempted to do as you walked into the room would be walk right over here and turn this switch on. If you do that, the TAs are going to slap your hand and tell you no. Most important thing is this valve. If the valve is turned all the way this way, so clockwise if you were looking down from the top, the valve will be closed. If the valve's closed, no flow will go through the pipe. If no flow is going through the pipe, this blower will generate quite a high pressure right here at pressure tap 1, which is connected over here to the manometer, pressure tap 1, and as a result that high pressure will push the water in the manometer all the way down here into the manifold, fill the manifold with air, blow air back up into the reservoir, and as a result the system will go out of balance and your TAs will be really upset with you. So if you want to show you know that you went to the, uh, to the uh, lab lecture and that you know what you're doing, when you walk in, walk right up to this, turn it counterclockwise, viewed from the top, all the way out until it's fully open. You don't need to really crank it, just until you, you reach some resistance there and then you'll know it's fully open. Once it's fully open, it would be safe to start the motor. But before you start the motor, check a couple of things. Check over here that the levels in these tubes are all about the same. They should be very close, within a tenth of an inch of each other. And they may not be precisely at zero, but you should record where they're at so that you've got a datum point. Then come over here to this inclined manometer and you'd like to have the red fluid line up with the zero on the scale. And you'd like to make sure that it's level in this little bubble here. So by loosening off this adjustment, you can adjust the manometer up and down. Whoop. Two hands helps. So now it's level. The bubble's right in the middle here. And if we look, that scale's not quite perfectly aligned to zero. So I'm going to loosen this screw and slide the scale just a little bit. Doesn't matter which part of the meniscus there you line up with, as long as it's the one that you use consistently for your reading. So now that looks like we've got that zeroed. We've got it leveled. These levels are all correct. Now we can go and turn on the blower. So the blower goes on. Whoops, we kind of missed seeing that. I'm going to try and do it again. Turn the blower off. And the levels are all coming back towards where they were originally. But it takes some time because the blower takes time to slow down and stop so there's still some flow coming through here and also it takes time for the fluid to move against the fluid friction in the manometer system but after a while it will all come back up to the same place that it was so now I'm going to turn the blower on again and we see some of them move way down and some of them move way up and then the whole system is sliding back down again. These ones, these last few on the end here, 
numbers 17 through 20 ought to come down to just about the same spot where they were when you started because there up here 18 19 20 just open to the atmosphere through these tiny little barb fittings up here so it takes a little while for them to equalize so these ones seem to have come in okay the rest have stopped moving and now we can take some readings now if you just looked at this initially you'd expect that the blower is creating a high pressure here and that because of friction and other resistances as we go along the pipe the pressure will drop further and further further and further as we go along so we should see a high pressure lower 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 all the way along but if we look at the manometer bank over here we do see a high pressure it's pushing the water down quite a long ways and we do see the pressure going to be a little bit lower less push down on the water with each of these until we get to about number five that's this one right here from five to six we don't see any real change at all well, that's only a short distance that's not too much of a surprise but actually from seven to eight on this one we actually see the pressure increases from seven to eight does that make any sense at all it does but only if you look at the details and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the lecture again across through these other ones no huge changes in pressure in part because you're looking at a much bigger pipe here so the velocity is slower and the losses are lower but when we get to right here between 14 and 15 that's going from this location here on one side of the orifice to this location here on the other side of the orifice a huge difference in pressure much higher pressure there than there is there there's two things going on one is Bernoulli effect that we'll talk about because of the fast moving flow through the orifice here and the other is just the losses that we have in the orifice and then again a significant pressure rise from 15 to 16 you'd think you should have friction losses from there to there but there's a significant pressure rise that's something you'll have to explain finally when we get to the outlet we have this pitot tube on the traverse so we can locate that at different locations in the flow and if we look in the middle of the flow we're seeing about one point 1.04 inches of water dynamic pressure so that's the pressure that you put into your Bernoulli equation to figure out what the velocity is there as we move away towards the outer edge we can move a fair distance and see almost no change if we move right down towards the wall we see that the dynamic pressure the dynamic head is dropping down to now about 0.8 inches of water and that represents a lower velocity, a substantially lower velocity right near the wall. But across the middle, it doesn't vary an awful lot. Only when we're out near the wall do you get significant variations. Then finally, we turn it off and we can see the manometer will eventually come back to an even position. Now one of the problems with the manometer, one of the difficulties is this really slow response time. So you have to have a steady flow and you have to pay enough attention to getting that steady flow, have enough patience to wait until the manometer comes to a final position. The main advantage of a manometer is its simplicity and its extraordinary accuracy. We know the density of the water in these tubes uh, very closely, 998 kilograms per cubic meter at uh, atmospheric conditions. We can measure this distance quite precisely to tenths of an inch or even to twentieths of an inch just off this scale or with this inclined manometer we can make an even more uh, detailed measurement because the incline allows us to stretch out the scale so that that's one inch of water that's two inches of water so we're looking at only the vertical distance but we stretched it out 
by putting it on an incline. That's why getting this level right is so important. There are four test rigs exactly like it. There's apparatus number two here. Around the corner on the other side, apparatus number one. It looks exactly the same. It has all the same characteristics, except the valves turned out here so shorter people can operate this one more easily. Uh, over on the other side of the room, we've got rig number four with the valve pointing out this way. And rig number three also with the valve pointing out this way. Now in the construction of these, we've got these little tubes that go off over the top. It's hard to see them down in underneath, but they go over the top and this one, number one, finds its way over here, comes out the board and is connected here to this pressure tap. Now this pressure tap has a little tube going through to the inside of the pipe, flush with the inside of the pipe so it's not sticking out at all, but unlike some of the pressure taps you saw in uh, MEC 215, it doesn't spread all the way around the circumference of the pipe. So you're measuring the pressure only on the top of the pipe right here. Likewise, the top of the pipe here, the top of the pipe, the top of the pipe on the outside of this curve, and the side of the pipe on the inside of the curve here. Now remember, we know something about momentum. In order to accelerate the flow and make it turn direction like this, we have to be exerting a force, something like this, through this elbow. That means the pressure is higher on the outside of the elbow and lower on the inside of the elbow. That's something you know from 241 when we talked about uh, momentum. So as a result, as it goes around here, this is probably a pretty accurate measure of what the pressure is all the way across this cross section. By the time we get down here, I think the pressure on the outside here is still going to be higher than the pressure on the inside. And as a result of that turn, we'll also have set up some secondary flows in the crosswise direction, two swirling vortices that could also have some effect here. And those vortices will probably continue at least a little bit all the way down to here as we go through this one where we're measuring on the inside of the pipe and the inside of the pipe both times. So that's worth noting. On the ends of the test rigs, we have instruments. We have a barometer which will tell you what the atmospheric pressure is. That's important for knowing the density of the air. Likewise, we have a temperature and, uh, and humidity measurement here. It'll also tell you what time it is. That tells you the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity in percent. So we've got a mixture of units. We've got inches of mercury, millimeters of mercury, or hectopascals that we can measure on the barometer. All of our piping system is made of ABS pipe in standard inch sizes that you'd actually encounter if you were designing a piping system, uh, at least in North America. The measurements on the manometer are in inches of water, both on this manometer and on this manometer. You'll probably find it an awful lot easier to take those measurements and convert them into millimeters of water or pascals or meters uh, before you do your calculations. Okay, and another thing I wanted to make sure that you figured out was this orifice plate is a measurement device. And we have different diameters. We have a one inch diameter here on apparatus number two. Over here on apparatus number three, we have a 1.054 inch diameter orifice. 20th of an inch difference. That doesn't seem like very much, but it'll make a difference in the pressure drop that you get for a particular flow rate or in the flow rate that you calculate for a particular pressure drop. The orifice plate is a, uh, a measurement device and it's the single biggest pressure difference that you see on, uh, on the manometer here between there 14 and there at 15. So if you were trying to get a particular flow rate, you would tr be aiming for a particular pressure difference between those two locations. And you'll do that calculation in the tutorial today. Now we started off with this valve turned fully 
counterclockwise, viewed from the top, in order to have the maximum flow rate. If we wanted to get a lower flow rate, we'd start closing the valve a little bit at a time. And we'd watch the effect on the manometer as we close the valve. So you'll notice that the pressure is increasing here and the difference between the two pressure taps on opposite sides of the, of the orifice is decreasing. And so we keep on closing the valve until we got to the right pressure difference between those two locations. What we want to be really careful of is that we don't keep on closing the valve so far that these two manometers blow out into the manifold because then we'll have air bubbles through the whole thing and that'll be a real mess. Your measurements will be poor and your TA will be very unhappy with you. So that's why we open the valve all the way. So here I am turning it again before we start the motor is so that we don't blow out these two tubes. Then slowly turn it clockwise until you get the difference you're looking for here or if you prefer the uh, manometer uh, value for the pitot tube here that indicates the flow rate that you think you should have. And we'll turn that slowly until we get the flow rate that we're looking for. Then we'll let it settle and then you can make your measurements.